From about 1945 to about 1961, the United States is seen by many historians as a society with affluence. We're going to talk about what that means today, and we're also going to talk about the first phase of the civil rights movement. So to introduce this lecture, I'm going to talk about three things in this lecture, primarily three topics. Number one, the prosperity in the United States after the war. Number two, the beginnings of the modern civil rights movement. And number three, a book that was very influential by Michael Harrington called The Other America. So the United States in about 1960 is considered an affluent society. I'm going to give you a few clues about what affluence means here in case you don't know. So for example, 60% of people in the United States, usually whites, own their homes. 75% of them owned a, a vehicle, a car, and about 87% of them owned a TV. So affluence involves owning things. The television revolution, which happened between 1950 to 1994, indicates to us that since people were more prosperous, they had a little bit more time on their hands. They're now watching television, a new technology that is getting really popular in the 1950s. So as you can see here, between 1950 and 1994, television viewing actually doubled because there was more TVs now in people's homes. And more and more people are spending time, for example, eating now dinner in front of their television. And you can see that the number of televisions in households increased exponentially by about 1960. So a lot more people had televisions. So continuing on this theme of affluence, I want to also tell you that the average worker's income increases by 35% around this time. More and more people are increasing their income by 1960, 1955. So we get a real big jump here in 1945, as you can see on the graph, the first red arrow. That indicates to us that that's the start of America's entrance in World War II. And then you get our GMP uh, increasing to almost $2 trillion by 1964, 1965. So because there's more affluence in American society, veterans get in on that. And in 1944, Congress passes the GI Bill, which guarantees, number one, full tuition for college, two, loans up to $2,000 for, for soldiers or ex-military, and they belong to the 5220 Club. And the 5220 Club guaranteed them $20 a week for 52 weeks, which is $20 a week for a year. Now, this produced a massive social revolution for the white middle class male population. That demographic saw a lot of prosperity during this time. So the American family migrates outside of the cities, and by 1950, about 20 million of them live in these tiny custom-built homes called uh, suburban homes and a lot of white families dreamt about this reality once they started working this was kind of like their goal for the future to to move out to the suburbs and live in one of these nice homes so more and more people are moving to the cities and you can tell that that uh the pr the prosperity moves these people out because by 1960 um, the, the rural population of the United States is getting smaller and smaller, and the city-dwelling population, and especially the suburban population, is increasing. So we went from 20% in 1940, suburban dwellers, to about 31% in 1960. So the American family is also growing in size, and, and Americans were marrying at younger ages, and by 1940, fertility rates were up the roof. So you see that 80 births were for about a thousand women but by 1957 with a baby boom we get 123 births for every thousand women it's a lot of babies so this generation is known as the baby boom generation and it's people that are born between 1946 and 1964 and totaling them it's about 76 million people so the baby boomers are a huge impact to our American society right after the war because by the late 1940s, of course, there's a huge demand for baby supplies. But by the 1950s, we need to build more schools for these children as they're growing. The 1960s see a huge increase in college enrollments because now these people are in their early 20s. But by the 1970s, they need a home because now they're in their 30s and they want to work and they want to buy their suburban house. So by the 80s and 90s, they start to retire from their jobs and they start to save money and invest now in the stock market. So the stock market sees a huge increase by this point. And right about now in 2017, a lot of these people are in their late stages of retirement and they're becoming a huge, huge burden on the social security system and the healthcare system. And it's because there's so many of them, 76 million people put a lot of, of stress on systems like social security and healthcare. The baby boom generation brought with them this thing called the youth culture. And you start seeing things like popular shows coming out like the Cleavers and or the Nelsons. And, and these families on TV show this kind of side of America that's very conformist. Conformist means that, that they follow the rules and that they're family oriented and that they, 
are nice moral people but some teens don't like this kind of idea and they rebel against it and there's reports of uh, juvenile delinquency that are starting to increase some people blame rock and roll of course because it wasn't as popular among the baby boom generation elvis presley is one of the uh, kind of idols of this time and he was popular he shocked parents and people watched them on the ed sullivan show kind of shaking his hips but he was more importantly kind of an indicator or a sign that future generations were going to see some conflict because these new ideas are coming in and they're modern and they're edgy and they're not so moral like they used to be so a lot of people don't like that but this brings me to the, the largest conflict of the time which is the civil rights movement and it's phase one this this is still early on in, in the civil rights movement after world war ii a lot of african americans receive high honors from the military and they expect racial equality when they come back because they fought the same fight that whites fought alongside them so this is a more of a symbolic change for example 1947 major league baseball sees jackie robinson take the center stage and he's uh one of the first african americans to play in the major leagues of baseball here and jackie robinson had also served in the military and he had also gone to college and he became the star for the brooklyn dodgers and he served as a role model more importantly for african americans who followed baseball by 1947 harry truman decides to establish the president's committee on civil rights and he desegregates the armed forces in 1948 against um, the backlash of the republicans in congress but the national association for the advancement of colored people the naacp attacks segregation through the court systems and they they get a a major win in 1954 with brown versus board of education of topeka kansas and in this case linda brown wanted to attend a school that was near her home but because she was black she had to be bused to a different section of the city and uh, two important individuals that you need to remember from this time are these two justices of the Supreme Court. The, the one on top here is Thurgood Marshall. He's an attorney for the NAACP, and he favors uh, Linda Brown here, and also w Earl Warren, which is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. They both favor this decision to desegregate public schools. So the biggest point that you're going to have here in the early civil rights movement is the 1954 decision. And it's the doctrine that establishes that separate but equal has no place in public schools and segregation in schools should be prohibited that means that schools should be fully integrated this had a, this had a tremendous impact but more importantly it moved us in the direction that you see now where schools are integrated and this was a the kind of like the spark that a lot of people were waiting for that ignited the modern civil rights movement now of course not all schools desegregated immediately a lot of them actually took their time a lot of them refused to but now it was the law of the land so you had to following the brown case the supreme court orders that schools be desegregated with quote all deliberate speed this means immediately elizabeth eckford which is pictured here is one of the little rock nine little rock arkansas nine students uh, faced a mob on the way to school and they're photographed here entering the school against the shouts and insults of other people. This woman in the background here that's shouting apologized 40 years later to Elizabeth Eckford. In Montgomery, Alabama, you see the most famous kind of display of, of civil disobedience from a woman called Rosa Parks, and she sparked the boycott. Uh, basically, she refused, you know the story, to move to the back of the bus. She was arrested. The black community is mobilizing and it's demanding change. And a lot of people get behind this kind of symbolic gesture, and they they rally around her in support. This is for the first time when you see Martin Luther King Jr. And he's in the early stages, so you don't see him as prominent, like I said earlier, you don't see him in the, in the foreground yet. But his goal is to integrate blacks into US society, and he uses this tactic called nonviolent protest, which is the opposite of a lot of others around him, like Malcolm X, who are supportive of violence against white people. Now, the boycott continues for about a year, and in 1956, buses in Montgomery become integrated. So the final topic of this lecture is about The Other America, this book by Michael Harrington, which spoke about poverty in the United States. So even though the United States was seeing a lot of affluence, when this book was published in 1962, um, Michael Harrington published in here that 22% of Americans are at or below the poverty level. That means that not everybody is affluent. Not everybody is rich or has a suburban home. 
And this is about 35 million Americans. So this is a large part of the population. So in conclusion, even though the United States was affluent, that's a generalization. Most Americans were not included in this affluence. This is also the beginning of the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement we see. And it involves a lot of people other than Martin Luther King Jr. So by the 1950s, this is the start of that phase. So what I want you to think about as you're finishing up with this lecture is which event or individual had the biggest impact on the U.S. during this era? 